it gives me great pleasure to invite the three parliamentarians who are going to join us today. I'm going to invite them one by one. Dr. Sanjay Jaiswal, he's been the Member of Parliament from Paschim Champaran since 2009. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Mr. Jairam Ramesh, representative in the Rajya Sabha for Karnataka and former Union Minister for Rural Development and for uh, Environment Forests. And Mr. Vincent Pala, the Member of Parliament from Shillong since 2009. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. I'm going to start off with you, Dr. Jaiswal. Um, as, a, as a little bit of prehistory, I first met Dr. Jaiswal in 2012. CW at that time was not even two years old as an institution. And we had this plan of trying to work on low carbon rural development. And we had some partners from, from uh, the United States, etc. The idea was, how do you not just look at clean energy independently, or water stress independently, or agricultural productivity, can we bring it together in a framework that works uh, uh, better? Now, of course, uh, in all honesty, I at that time failed to raise the money for that particular program. But we got a lot of insights and encouragement from Dr. Jaiswal. Seven years on, you know, and so much has happened. You know, India is leapfrogging in some ways in the energy space, and in some ways it's still stumbling. The theme of this panel was how do we make the energy transition a poll issue, an election issue, something that we connect with constituents. I request you to reflect first on when you hear the words energy transition and you think of your constituents, what comes to mind? What is the best way to even communicate what we are talking? Or what is it that they want that we are not listening to them about? Microphone. Hey, good evening, everyone. And, uh, Yes, I met him in 2012, and that time just uh, Jawaharlal Nehru mission has come. Frankly speaking, this time we won the elections with uh, such a huge majority. It was only because of the electricity which we were able to get in the rural households, as well as the clean cooking uh, LPG cylinders to villagers. Uh, but there are so many other issues uh, in our constituency which really needs to be think on the perspective of uh, CW or at international level. And uh, these are how to utilize the local fuels uh, efficiently in uh, marketing or in uh, our daily uh, energy needs. Like uh, you all know we have got a huge methane problem if you are talking about clean energy. There is an alternative of a biogasifier. We are trying to put uh, biogasifiers in each and every household so that it will give one clean energy. It will save our uh, foreign uh, dollars as well as uh, it will tackle the climate parliament. So we have to think on a uh, wholesome uh, Issue. It's not just about having a clean energy or uh, giving uh, best energy access to your constituents. It's more important is that how to have energy locally, which can help uh, globally. That's what I have to say about my constituents. Thank you. Um, I have to uh, also apologize. I was remiss in not mentioning Mukul Sharma. Uh, from Climate Parliament for partnering with us in this final discussion. Um, thank you very much, Mukul. And, and all power to Climate Parliament. I believe there are more than 100 parliamentarians as your members. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Pala, I'm going to come to you. Um, I've been to Shillong only once. Um, it's a beautiful part of the country. But here's a problem. A lot of the renewable energy capacity that has come up in India has largely been concentrated in about eight states, whether it's solar or wind. How do we make sure that what we're talking about energy transitions, whether it's access to energy, whether it's in cleaner energy, whether it's using 
cleaner energy for the productive economy. My colleagues have analyzed there's a $53 billion opportunity in the rural economy on using distributed renewable energy for income generating activities. Please tell us what could we do as a country to spread this energy revolution more towards the, the northeastern states. Thank you and good evening to everybody. I think as far as Northeast is concerned, like the rest of the world, you know, if you compare to the mainlands and the Northeast, in the Northeast in terms of clean energy, more clean energy in the Northeast, for example, like in my states, we have a demand of almost 800 megawatts in a year. So we have almost self-sufficient in that compared to the rest of the states. With the development going on, we cannot avoid energy, be it uh, whatever you say, be it made in India, be it is uh, uh, digital India, energy is becoming, the, the demand becomes more and more. I think what we can do is that we can set up a grid. In the Northeast, we have a capacity of 53,000 megawatts, only renewable energy. Forget about fossil energy, we have lots of coal, especially in Meghalaya, Arunachal, and Nagaland. So we have a huge potential, but the demand of energy in the Northeast because of less in terms of industrial, less in populations, only four and a half crores in the Northeast. I think what we need to have, we have to enhance the grid, like we have enhanced the national highway, so we have to enhance the grid from the Northeast. It should be transported to all over, the, all over India. So I've seen now with the enhancement of the grid uh, for the last 10, 15 years, there's lots of change in the mindset of people also. For example, like in my constituency, if you go to the remote areas, you'll see people are charging their mobile in the solar. And in small shops, he earned not less than four, 500 uh, rupees a day by charging the mobile because there's no electricity by charging the mobile. So people are aware of the importance of energy. So the transitions to use the energy for, like you said, as uh, topics in the election, I think that speaks by itself. I've seen in my own constituency and in Arunachal, I've been traveling. I've seen in the remote areas where there's no electricity, but with the solar there. So you see that people realize the importance of energy and that is, like Sanjay Jaswal has said, I think if we can give them a proper energy, if we can give them a proper guidelines, I think it will help not only for charging the mobile, but even for the women, also they use it as a stove. So many things they use it. So I think it's very important. People know that as long as we move forward, we cannot move with, uh, without energy, whatever we do. I think uh, we can use this as a pull wherever we go. For me, whenever I go, because after Mukul has taken all over the world to see what is energy and being a part of the parliamentarians in energy. He has taken us to Germany, has taken us to so many places. We have seen how the world moves forward. Without energy, we cannot do so. I think that is a, uh, a platform where also we can tell the people how to conserve energy, how to develop energy, and how to use the energy I mean, efficiently so that we can have a, especially in the states when we have a self-sufficient in energy. Thank you. One of the, one of the uh, badges of honor we like to uh, carry is our efforts again in 2012, 13, 14 to create another institution called CLEAN, the Clean Energy Access Network. And it was a network of decentralized renewable energy companies working in uh, off-grid and, and uh, rural areas. At that time, we counted there were 250 such companies in the country. Now that has increased to more than 400 such companies. And uh, some work that we released yesterday, um, I just also want to qualify that while we are organizing this event, we are not an event organizing organization. We are actually a research organization. At Energy Horizons, we've released 12 new research publications, one of which was on counting jobs. And uh, while grid-connected solar um, and, and renewables have created nearly one lakh jobs now, off-grid energy has also created 95,000 jobs. And that's direct jobs. Uh, and a lot of them are actually working in the, in the Northeast. Uh, Mr. Ramesh, I'm gonna now come to you. My, the prehistory with Mr. Ramesh goes back even further. I was a, 
Uh, I first encountered him when I invited him when, as a student uh, in Delhi University to come and talk to us way back in the late 1990s. I think we were talking about financial crises at that time. Uh, the, uh, in this interim 20 years or so since I have uh, known you and seen the various roles that you've played, the question I have for you is, how would you describe to Indians and to the world what India's energy needs are, how they are changing, and how India could lead in driving this change? Well, uh, the most serious, uh, the biggest challenge that we face is 50 million homes need reliable access to electricity. Uh, that's about 20% of India's population, uh, which requires electricity, which is still not uh, either on grid or off grid electricity. So, you know, while we talk about energy transitions and energy security and so on, these are, you know, fancy sounding big macro concepts. But the real micro challenge is to ensure that 50 million homes across the country, uh, many of them in Sanjay's state, a uh, large part of them in Sanjay's state, of Bihar uh, have access to electricity for their day-to-day -day cooking, lighting, uh, farm needs, uh, commercial needs, and so on. So I think that remains a big challenge. The other thing that has happened, uh, Arunaba, in the last 25 years, uh, you know, I look at my own, uh, you know, in the mid-80s, one of the, probably the first thing I ever did in government was to do uh, energy projection for the year 2004-2005. Uh, and it was a 25-year projection that was done in the Planning Commission. It was a 500-page report. And as I read that report today, nowhere in the report the word environment figures. You know, it was all about demand options. It was all about supply options, looking at biogas, looking at fuel wood, looking at coal, looking at natural gas, LNG, and so on. But the word environment and the word climate just doesn't figure. And I laugh at myself and I say, in 25 years, you know, things have moved. So today, uh, our challenge on the energy front is as much a challenge on the environment front. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, it's, it's both. And the third thing I would say, is the, the cruel conundrum in India is that while we make this transition to a renewable future, which I'm sure we will do, we would still be uh, consuming over a billion tons of coal. Uh, we just cannot uh, afford to do without coal. And now, clean coal is an oxymoron, so I suppose we have to look at cleaner coal. Uh, and we have not been able uh, to be as aggressive as France has been uh, on nuclear. So our options, while we must embrace, and we have embraced renewables very aggressively, uh, the, the, the cruel paradox of India, given the demand, given the demographics, don't forget we are going to add 400 million people in the next 30 years. We are going to be 1.7 billion by the year 2020-45. Uh, and so given this demographic reality, uh, coal will continue to be uh, uh, the, the, the central element of India's energy supply basket. Uh, and we have to uh, address the questions of cleaner coal, cleaner coal mining, cleaner coal transportation, cleaner coal utilization. In our, you know, uh, we're all starry-eyed about renewables, but, you know, I would take you back and say that you need that base load capacity, and that base load capacity can come either from nuclear or from coal. Unfortunately, I think nuclear uh, is, is simply not on the cards the type of expansion that we had hoped for. So therefore, coal remains with us. And that's, that's a, it's a very cruel choice to make. 30 years ago, it was not a cruel choice. But today, in the context of global warming, in the context of environment, the continued use of coal on the scale that India has to uh, is indeed cruel not only for India, but cruel for the rest of the world as well. So let me come back to you, Dr. Jaswal, and pick up on something that Mr. Ramesh has just said, that when the previous energy policy was written, the word environment or climate did not figure. Now again, coming back to this theme of making this issue a poll topic, climate risks is something that is not just in the future, it's here and now. We feel it in terms of heat stress in our cities and in rural areas. We're feeling it in terms of extreme weather events, coastal flooding, 
drought. We're feeling it in terms of loss in agricultural productivity. These are here and now livelihood issues, life issues for people. Do you hear these issues coming to you from your constituents? Uh, maybe they're not using the language of climate, but what is the language they're using? How are they understanding the variability and vulnerability in terms of, say, agricultural output? First of all, I would like to add that I still believe that what has happened in the whole world about climate and world environment, it has more to do with the crude oil prices when it reached $130 or $140. That was uh, the real issue which has started changing the Western world. I think it it's more has to do that. Uh, about the question of, of the rural people, they are uh, realizing much more than what we are realizing at present. 30 years back, any villager will tell you that at what time the rainfall is coming. He was knowing very well when it's a sowing season, when, when he will be having uh, to start his cultivation. Now the weather has become so erratic that everyone is facing that heat and the poor people are facing, facing much more. I live in a Indo-Nepal border, which is a sub-Himalayan terrain. And uh, suddenly, first we saw a spat, like 10 years of drought, which was uh, unimaginable for a place like uh, sub-Himalayan terrain. But, and since last three years, two seasons we are seeing flood every other, what we call the rainy season has not started properly till now. And still the whole Bihar, Bengal and Assam, the bordering area is flooded. And though we haven't uh, had that uh, proper rainy season, I still remember in 2017, we faced the worst flood of uh, since last 20 or 30 years. We, in fact, the uh, seniors were telling that we haven't seen such kind of flood in last 80 years. But the irony was that uh, we have got uh, Indo-Nepal National Highway. The one reason of that highway was flooded. All the blocks were, there was like were inaccessible. All the villages were uh, living outside their area. And at the same time, just next to that road, where uh, farmers were demanding that we need a drought relief. So that means it's happening in one district, in one road, just because the rivers are on this side and this. Um, after that road, the rivers don't, uh, are not there. And they were having a drought situation and we were uh, having the worst flood. So common men is, are realizing much more than what we are realizing because it has changed their lifestyle. They are unable to grow when, uh, like in rice, you have to uh, sow it twice. They, they are unable to decide when to uh, do the seeding of the rice and when to transplant them. They are unable to decide that. That has made their life very difficult. So they are realizing much more. They are more aggressive that yes, we should do something for environment. And this has changed in just uh, 10 years. I still remember uh, the climate parliament group was formed by Milin Devra. And he asked, we all were in estimate committee members. And he asked, are you interested in climate issue? I'm a professionally, I'm a doctor. I said, Ki, yes, it's my passion that, that to work for environment, for forest. And at that time, when we were uh, started talking about uh, environment and uh, clean energy, the seniors will say, Ki, see, you all have, youngsters have been trapped by uh, Western industrialists. First, they sold us uh, thermal power plants. Now they want to sold, uh, sell us solar PV and you all are youngsters are like uh, part of their game. You all are not understanding what the fact is. Now they are realizing much more that it was the need of that time. So the transition is everywhere. So Mr. Pala, this issue of climate risks, I want to address it to you as well. In fact, in 2008, when the government brought up the National Action Plan on Climate Change, one of them was on Himalayan ecosystems. Uh, so whether it's in the Western Himalayas or in the Eastern Himalayas, these are vulnerable. They're biodiversity hotspots, but they're also vulnerable, even more vulnerable to climate change than, say, our plains. How are the people feeling climate risks 
where, where in, in your part of the country. Yeah, I um, agree with you actually. Uh, even in the Northeast, what people feel that the effects of climate change in, is more than is we expected. For example, like Meghalaya is the highest rainfall in the world, now it's no more. We have got lots of water sources, okay, body, water body we used, we used to for the drinking water. So we used to lay pipes and get that water for drinking in the village for the last 30, 40 years. Now it's dried up. So not only that, many other things also is happening. So people felt the climate change in the Himalayan regions. And uh, I think not only that, uh, I think much too also about the policy. I think uh, we have to do lots about the policy. For example, in order to encourage people, for example, I've seen in Australia, every household, they have a solar panel. And what the government has done is that in case your requirement is more than you produce, you can sell it through a grid or maybe a clusters of area where you can sell as a community or me as a locality, you can combine together and sell it to the grid. So that has to do much more with the policy and how much the government will buy, what will be the provisions, what is the facilities they're giving. I think it's high time, be it in the Northeast, be in the areas, I say policy has to be innovate from time to time. Policy has to be, and investment has to be made on energy because uh, if I talk, I need a mic, I need energy. If I'm mobile, I need an energy. Yeah, we need industries, employments, we need energy, whatever we do. Uh, you know, I stay in Luton areas where even the electricity stops for five minutes, then I start calling them. So same in the, same in the village also. They cannot now, they, they understand the importance of energy and they cannot live without energy. So I think this is a very important. The transitions also has to, the government has to, to think in terms of policy in such a way that it will be, uh, encourage the people you know, to use the best resources which we have. I think that's very important. Mr. Ramesh, I want to look a little more to the future now. And, and um, then I remember in the lead up to the Copenhagen Climate Summit, uh, you were one of the first few political leaders in the country artic articulating for a very different approach of, for India to take in climate negotiations. Uh, but my question is less related to climate negotiations and more related to is there an economic case for India to leapfrog? And, 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 th and, and I'm not countering necessarily what you said about the base load of coal, but is there money to be made? Are there jobs to be created, new enterprise? The youth that Dr. Jaiswal was referring to, you know, when, uh, you know, this, this, are young parliamentarians getting entrapped by Western agendas, or is this an agenda that we can make our own? What could be that policy framework to take us to a different future? Well, there's an ancient Indian uh, saying, Kopastaha Manduka, don't be a frog in the well. Yeah. But now we're all frogs, because all of us want to leapfrog. But you know, we're all leapfrogging, but, but let's understand that what is entailed in this leapfrogging. I mean, you need, you can't do away with basics when you're doing the leapfrogging. Uh, I think it's all very well to say we should leapfrog, we should leapfrog. Uh, the first leapfrogging took place when uh, the new government expanded the target for uh, the solar, for the solar mission, five times, and you know I welcomed it, and that's a good example of a gigantic leapfrog. But is that going to solve India's energy problems? No, uh, it's it's an important element, it's a crucial element, uh, but you need the basics. So I think we need we need to look at not just the technological leapfrogging, but that. It has to be underpinned by an institutional change, institutional leapfrogging. And there are changes that will come about in the political economy, uh, which we also have to come to terms with. For example, uh, large parts of many states, the poorer states of India, uh, are dependent on coal for their revenues. I mean, Sanjay comes from a state uh, which was divided, but before 2000, a large part of the revenues of his state from, came from royalties on coal. Now, if coal is going to come down in en India's energy basket and renewables is going to grow up as it must, uh, how are these states going to be affected? 
they are depending even today, you know, uh, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, uh, large parts of Andhra, Maharashtra, all depend on coal for their revenues. Uh, I can imagine a situation 10, 15 years ago when that's not going to be the case. Right. So how do you deal with the political economy yes. of that situation? So the point I want to make is that, yeah, we sh technology is one part of the leapfrogging effort. There is also an institutional change that is required. And there's also regulatory changes and political economy changes that are required. And I think we must learn from Germany in this regard. I think the Germans, uh, the energy transition that the Germans did uh, between the year 2000 and 2015, that was an expensive transition, no doubt. Uh, but it was a transition to the extent that today one third of Germany's energy supply, supply, not one third of energy's capacity, one third of energy, Germany's energy supply comes from renewables, largely solar. And Germany has no business to be the world's uh, leader in solar energy. You know, it's got no competitive <laughs> advantage uh, in solar. Uh, but they've done it. Uh, and I think they did it because they, they recognized there's a technology, there is an institutional change, there is a political economy change, and they re-architectured the entire grid to make the, facilitate this transition. So, um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Jaswal, I'll come back to you on this issue of political economy. Um, Mr. Ramesh has rightly pointed out, and even at CEW, we think of technology as only one of the four legs of the, of the stool. Uh, policy is another. Finance and business models is another, which is exactly why we've created a new center for energy finance. And the fourth is behavioral change, nudge strategies again. But this issue of political economy impacts all these four legs. Political economy impacts how much R&D goes into new technologies, impacts how consumers react to tariffs. Over the decades, one of the issues that we've still not managed to solve is the legacy problems in our power sector. And I wrote about this even this week in the Hindustan Times, that our so-called leapfrog is going to be hemmed in until we are able to deal with the crisis in our distribution companies across the country. And governments of many parties have attempted to deal with it. I want to learn from you how are legislators thinking about this issue? Because this is holding back India's development. And series of bailouts over the last several decades have not yet fully succeeded. So there must be something else. As Einstein said, madness means doing the same thing again and again, expecting a different result. What is something different we can do? See, we, uh, India is like, Frankly speaking, we always make our plans for five years. We don't know whether we are coming in next time in power or not, and that's why the whole legacy issue is. We miss the solar PV manufacturing time. Now when uh, we are talking about uh, electric cars, we have already missed the lithium mines. China has gone ahead, they have bought so many mines, they, have, they are fully prepared that what they are going to do for the next 20 years. We always try to do something, but it's never enough. Like, Uday scheme is very good, and uh, we reduce the burden from estates, discounts from 60,000 crores to 20,000 crores. But I'm pretty sure that in the next two or three years, again, it will rise up again to 60,000 crores. Because uh, every government, and they should think, we want to be more populist rather than more uh, working governments, frankly speaking. And uh, center can make only policies. The implementation has come to, from states. And uh, there the real problem starts. They are not worried about what the, what the policies, and it's a cooperative federalism, so you can't pressurize them also that, okay, we have given you this much money, you know, that, then why your discounts are again uh, going red? So that's the problem, and uh, frankly speaking, I was uh, meeting few people from CII, it was just simp a simple transition between the government from uh, Chand Babu Naidu to Jagan, and uh, things have become so much problematic for uh, 
solar industry in Andhra Pradesh. Even I was shocked. I was not knowing it. I talked to the minister that you have to interfere and you have to solve their problems. But it was really shocking for me that how a government commitment cannot be followed by the next government which comes into the power. But they feel uh, very proud of that. So <laughs> we have to tackle these problems. I, we are working with so many researchers, like in Bihar, we have improved. We haven't improved up to that 15% mark, but smart bit rings and so many other things which we are trying to do. But uh, we always catch a late train. I don't know, uh, frankly speaking, we are trying our best, but cooperative federalism and uh, State governments have got their own agenda. Central government has got its own agenda. We accept on some issues. Uh, we don't think uh, together. And we talk, of course we talk together. There are so many things where we talk together, but we have to follow and uh, we have to be more, uh, the word we can say that unpopular government. Like, uh, when we become very rigid, we are uh, doing fines on the people who are aware, like there was an electricity theft in so many villages. Mm -hmm. We are trying to improve that. But uh, still, it's uh, not that easy as said. But uh, India has uh, always got a capacity to come back again. Sure. And I'm sure uh, the way things are going on, it will take another two to three years we will solve this problem unless and until our discounts are yes. cash rich. Yes. How much uh, solar or wind or whatever uh, efficient energies we can talk, we are not going to survive and succeed. So we have to be very rigid, but it's all about, uh, frankly speaking, I see these uh, projects as giving direct bribe to your voters. And so the local uh, political interference is much more higher than what we make in our policies. Right. I think we need to solve that. We will solve it, I'm sure. So in fact, uh, this point about cash, at least cash positive discoms is critical. Uh, at uh, CEW, one of the things we've started doing is working with distribution, uh, distribution companies to develop new business lines where normally they think renewable energy is going to take their best consumers away, or it'll become even more expensive. So we've been developing new business lines for them for getting more money. And in fact, we're going to be starting to pilot some of this out uh, in Delhi. And uh, hopefully soon we'll begin some work in Bihar as well. But going back to this issue of behavioral change, we set up an office in um, Lucknow last year to work with consumers on uh, power sector. To understand, and first thing we, we called it uh, jokingly or tongue in cheek, the theft survey. Not to kind of figure out, you know, how much is being stolen. There are many estimates. But to figure out what is your perception. If I asked you, do you steal electricity? You might say, no, I don't. But if I ask you, do you think your neighbor steals electricity? Do you think it is the right for your neighbor to steal electricity? Do you think your electricity bills will go up? If your neighbor steals a vaccine, you begin to get very different kinds of answers. So I have a flash question for all three of you. Do you think your constituents would agree to pay more for electricity as long as it's, I'm qualifying, as long as it's reliable and, 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 and uh, safe? Mr. Fala? Uh, I, I think um, what you have said is right, uh, especially I think uh, almost 30% of uh, energy is uh, waste only because in transmissions. Mm -hmm. Especially in the rural areas, when you go in the evening, you see almost every household, they'll put a wire, just put on top of it. When you go in the morning, you feel there's nothing but in the evening, you see. So that's why that resolves to a lot of uh, burn of transformers and they'll come to us. See, uh, we don't have transformers for the last 10 days or sometimes weeks together, months together. When we call them normally, they said, what happened? They said that the household who are, who are paying the bills 
is only 50 percent and these households are on theft like what exactly you say is 50 percent hmm. so when they don't get energy when they don't get electricity for weeks together months together they do realize as a community we would all of us should come back together and sometimes they're ready even to buy a new transformer that shows that if we can give them right. a good electricity a regular electricity and reliable electricity i think people are ready to pay some of them who cannot afford some of them who are not ready mm -hmm. but if you work with the policy or we work with the community i don't know in other consensus but as far as my consensus uh, i've seen personally i've been involved and uh, when i call the entire community very less people say that we are not going to pay they'll try to negotiate the theft is still there yeah. but wherever the board electricity board did not repair the transform for more than a month mm. they're ready to pay once it is repaired right so that shows that you know people are ready to pay but you have to make them, them quality understand quality service yeah, mr service. ramesh yeah. you think people will be ready to pay I mean, more? It's, uh, it's a no brainer 20 years ago a uh, very senior chief minister of sanjay's party mr bairo singh shekhawat announced a policy in rajasthan that those who will pay for power mm. will get priority in terms of pump set energization. Mm. Uh, and he was flooded with demand uh, because the choice was uh, paying and getting reliable electricity and not paying and getting unreliable electricity. And the bulk of the people ended up uh, volunteering to pay. When I was minister for drinking water, we introduced a scheme in Maharashtra for uh, you know piped water supply. Uh, the only condition was that you pay right. a flat rate right. uh, per month, not a metered rate, right. because you know meter is a bigger headache. Uh, so this metering in India is a it's an invitation for corruption. So it's a it's a flat rate. So we just introduced a flat rate, and people started paying on that flat rate. The question is who retains the revenue? If the local community retains the revenue, the greater the chance, the greater the probability that they are ending, going to end up paying. But if they're paying and that money is going to some distant uh, governing entity and the benefits of paying do not get reflected back, then I think the problem is the institutional paying. reform also you were referring to. Dr. Jaiswal, would your constituents pay more? Yeah, my answer is also yes. And I have seen that in villages where there is covered wires and there is a DP junction box. Uh, people are paying pretty well. And the second thing which uh, Bihar government made a policy that if your transformer goes wrong, we'll give you another transform only if there is a payment of 75% of your electricity right. bill. Right. And suddenly we are seeing that uh, within 24 hours all the bills, even the villagers get involved with them to clear your bill, otherwise we all are not going to get electricity. And uh, that was one of the reasons why suddenly the payment has started in Bihar, otherwise mm -hmm. Bihar, Bengal, the whole is turned in India. Right, right. On the pay, uh, for paying for electricity, like getting the payment was a difficult task. Right. But once we have connected it with transformer, they wait, uh, they may not pay on a regular basis, but once their transformer goes wrong, they readily pay it within 24 hours because they really need that reliable electricity. So in a, in a way, what you, your earlier comments, you ended, yeah. People want to pay, but the politicians don't want don't. people to pay. I mean, no, that's so, the, so that's the thing. That's the the politicians issue. in the name of the people are saying they will I not pay. See. But, the, but here are three politicians are saying actually the, the populist thing Sanjay to do is actually to raise really boldly tariffs. here. But you know, in his constituency, he's not going to go out there <laughs> advocating people. To that's pay. why the, whether this will be a poll issue. Okay, I have one final set of questions uh, to all three of you, which is to you know. I, this afternoon, uh, I was saying that we have a seeming impossible trinity of trying for growth, uh, trying for sustainability, but also creating jobs. And if you think about it, sometimes you achieve two, but not the third. So I want to ask you all about industrial policy, or let's talk about economic growth policy. Do you see energy transitions, energy horizon, whatever you want to call it, as a potential to not just leapfrog to a different energy mix, but a different industrial mix, a different way of making in India, a different way of creating jobs. Do you see any such flavor of demand from the people? I would like to work in a renewable energy company, or I would like to be trained 
as a solar you know, fixer. Uh, just want to get a sense of, do you see this at all as a job creator? I think it's uh, really a job creator. For example, uh, you see in Africa, last time when I went, I've seen lots of Indians, hundreds of Indians who has gone to Africa mm -hmm. to fix the solar and they've been employed there. Right. Some of them used to get two, three thousand in terms of rupees right. in a day. Right. So definitely it'll be there. I, I think, uh, as you know, that uh, most of the energy producer, maximum NPAs are from the energy producer, from power producer, I think, power producer. Right. So I think uh, we should also be ready. Uh, Sir is an economist, he knows better. Sometimes in India, we want easy everything. I come from the Northeast. When he was a minister, I used to come to him for roads. And I used to tell him, sir, don't give us money, give us roads. Guns, don't give us money, give us guns. <laughs> give us the infrastructure. So I think here also, in terms of energy, we should not, especially for we politicians, we'll always try to go along with the public. But if there's a policy, for example, Reliance, Airtel, and you. People will not mind paying more money if you get a better service. Same electricity also. I think when they get a better service, naturally they'll be employed because their work will be done. Naturally their work will be done. For example, the more they get their work done and the more they'll get money and uh, be it energy, be it anything, we cannot avoid without energy. I think definitely uh, if you put more solar, but we have to train, we have to skill the people. We must have a policy where we can give incentive to them. So one, of the great, one of the greatest disservice you leapfroggers do uh, to, to reality is that you make it sound as if nothing comes without a cost. The 8% growth or the 9% growth that we all aspire for has an ecological cost, has a sustainability cost. Uh, and if you were to push me, uh, you know, I've been on both sides of the fence, on the growth side and the environmental side. There is a choice. You, do you want an 8% growth, uh, which is ecologically unsustainable, or a 7% growth that is ec ecologically sustainable? I would put up my hands and say I choose a 7% growth path. But today, if I were to say that, <laughs> I must be in the wrong audience because every time I have said this, uh, people have said, I'm, you know, prophet of doom. I'm Dr. No. Uh, but the fact is, today in India, unfortunately, the public discourse is dominated by this thinking that we can have 8% and we can also have sustainability. It's simply not possible. Dr. Jaswan, are there trade-offs? Uh, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I believe that we can have both together. I frankly believe because... Uh, we are losing all our money in fossil fuel, giving all the money to Middle East. I think there is a solution. We only need a disrupt. We will. We should wait for a disruptive technology. And uh, as a uh, just uh, for your knowledge, as a member of Climate Parliament, we all are working for a green grid alliance in future, where there will be a single DC grid from Shekang Desert to Morocco. And that's it. At present, it's uh, just an idea which uh, we have started thinking of it. But if we can do it in future, in 2050, we'll have a reliable energy, we will have a reliable source, and uh, we will be generating a lot of jobs. Fossil fuel doesn't produce any job. You are buying gas, you are buying diesel, petrol. It's not producing any job. You are just uh, putting your hard-earned money to another's kitty. So I think I'm a born optimist, and uh, we are, I always think that we can take care of our environment, we can take care of our growth, we can take care of our energy need. The only thing is that we have to be honest to ourselves, and uh, we should be ready for some unpopulist measure. F fortunately, our government, for four and a half years, we worked very faithfully for development, but ultimately it's about unless and until you come to the power, you cannot do any good to the people. So uh, we have to balance all those things. And uh, I'm pretty sure that by in the next five years, 
we will find a proper solution where we will take care of environment as well as growth. Well, uh, just to put some numbers behind that, our estimate is that at uh, 100,000 megawatts of solar and 60,000 megawatts of wind, India will create a workforce of 330,000 people. But that relies significantly on distributed renewables because rooftop solar creates seven times more jobs per unit of electricity than even utility scale solar, which creates more jobs than wind, which creates more jobs than coal. Um, but put it in contrast, and many of you have mentioned it, I think Mr. Ramesh particularly, uh, quite explicitly, Coal India also employs 310,000 people. It used to employ about 370,000 people, that number has dropped. So, and the jobs in coal are in a different place from where the jobs in renewables are. So there is a just equitable transition that also needs to happen. In the interest of time, I'm gonna take two, if you are very disciplined, maybe three questions uh, from the floor. So who wants to ask um, our representative something? Yes, there's a hand in front here. Yes, sir. Please keep it very short. Uh, first of all, thank you. So if, it, like, uh, so if you look at water, energy, uh, or if you look at environment, uh, cities having a population crisis, everything in my mind comes down to scarcity and population. Do you think India is in a moment when it needs a population control policy? Okay, that's one question. Kaneka, right up in front. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that somewhere between what Mr. Ramesh and Dr. Jaiswal said about the trade-off or la op absence of a trade-off, where does health figure in all this? And Dr. Jaiswal, as a doctor, what is, what about the health impacts of, say, even microclimate or, or um, you know, air pollution, and the and the amount of public money that is spent in dealing with that? Can that money be redirected towards actually doing something to avoid that burden on the exchequer? Okay. A, a third burning question, right at the back there, yes, there. Could you raise your hand, then they'll know where to pass the microphone, yes. Hi, um, Dr. Uh, Jairam Ramesh, you had mentioned the potential role that nuclear power could play in forming a low carbon baseload for India's power grid, but then said that's probably not the best, not the most viable option, so it'll probably unfortunately stick with coal. So I'm interested in hearing more of your thoughts on nuclear and whether it's, why it's not viable or whether it is. Uh, the question was you were earlier referring to nuclear and you contrasted India with, with France which had done a lot. So what are your current thoughts on nuclear? And for the other two questions, one on health, uh, one on population, I leave it to all three of you to choose which ones you want to answer. Like in Parliament, you can choose I, to ignore the go the for population. <laughs> I think all the problems in India is only because we are still uh, not having uh, any proper serious policy on population stabilization. We are seeing two India at present, the southern five, six states which have got an economy equal to that middle income group, they are equal to uh, Thailand or Malaysia, they are reaching at that level and we are having an economy of North India which is uh, parallel to the worst countries of Africa. And I think uh, population has, is the biggest uh, problem on these uh, states, including my state. And we try to work, but you can't frame laws for that. You have to sensitize people. I strongly believe that you have to sensitize people. And I'm very proud that uh, when uh, uh, four years back, I, uh, my district was worst in male sterilization. Now it tops in India for male sterilization. So we, uh, as a member of parliament, we think that we have to work on these issues unless and until we solve our population problem. We are, three per, we are having 3% land with 2% of water and 18% of population. It's not going to survive for pretty long, how much we try. So we have to be very firm. I have tried my best to pursue uh, health ministers and they have done something, though not uh, how much we wanted, but uh, 
population has been always core of my political will and I always raise those issues and I think unless until we solve this problem, how much uh, development we are having, we are not going to achieve our goal. Would you, would you like to attempt an answer on the question of the health costs as well? See, see uh, I will give example of uh, my daughter. Like she went to a hotel for dinner and she said, Dad, I hate politicians. I said, why? That previously we were not giving any taxes, we were just giving 200, now you are charging 1,000 from us, the students. So, because the GST, SGST and CGST, you said, you all politicians are good for nothing. She was already paying that, but because she was not paying it directly, she never realized that how much taxes she is giving on any goods. Health is a huge issue. Uh, we are overburdened by the finances which we are having on health and it's more pricier than our development, what we are giving for our development. But it's not on the front foot, so nobody wants to calculate that money. But as a doctor, I can say that that is much more costlier than what we are having our GDP growth. Right. Mr. Ramesh? Well, on population, uh, it'll surprise you to know that very large parts of India have actually done the demographic transition. Uh, South India is going to see population starting to decline in the year 2040. But there are six states of India where there is a demographic momentum. Uh, and even if all Indians decide not to marry tomorrow, we are still going to be 1.7 billion people by the year 2040, because that's the bulge that you're dealing with. Uh, but don't be under the impression that astronomical increases in population is taking place because large parts of Western India, Northern India, and all of Southern India are at below replacement levels of fertility, which are almost at Scandinavian levels today, which is you know, something that we normally don't uh, appreciate. Uh, and this has happened democratically, not, you know, not through the coercion which we associate with China and which we had for a brief period between 1975 and 1977. On the health and uh, environment issue is absolutely right. Environment is today a health issue. Uh, uh, and uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the mortality estimates between the year 2000 and 2015, something like 8% uh, of all deaths in India, mortality in India, was attrib attributable to pollution. Uh, we are not talking of morbidity, we are now talking of mortality. Uh, but if you include morbidity, then, of course, the health environment nexus becomes uh, even more stronger. Air pollution, water pollution, chemical contamination, very, very serious. On nuclear, we can have a debate later, but the fact is that today nuclear accounts for about 3.5% of our electricity supply. Under the most optimistic scenario, this is going to increase to about 5% by the year 2030. It's unlikely to go beyond 2030 unless, you know, uh, there is some great breakthrough in fusion, mm. which I have been reading about for the last 30 years, uh, or in thorium, which I have been reading since I was <laughs> a small kid. The revolution kid. always around so the corner. I think nuclear is a god that has failed. So I think we have to understand that. Yes. Mr. Pala, population or health impacts. Yeah, I, I think uh, last time when I went with Dr. Sanjay Jaswal in uh, Russia, I'm not a doctor, but I was surprised when they said they have done a research, 60% of the heart attack is from pollution. So I think uh, whatever we do, I think, uh, you know, is environment and health and development have a, a good relations. So I think whatever we do in the future, if we want to sustain, I think uh, when we produce more energy, definitely we have to take environment, you know, we have to take that also along with us, whatever we do. And uh, the environments we have to keep in mind, that's very important for us. Otherwise, in the future, like Jairam Ramesh has said, that we may grow 10%, but we will, land up, uh, we will be landing in spending mo maximum money in, the, in our health issues. So I think what they have done in Germany, whatever program, whatever they do, whatever plan they made, they add certain percentage in health, be in the form of cess, be in the form of anything. I think that we, uh, I think we should follow the system so that, you know, in the future, our people also, we, we have to pay for the health. At the same time, we'll realize that, uh, that we require to develop along with our health system, which we should keep in mind. 
one of the more interesting um, projects that we did in the last couple of years was some uh, work in Chhattisgarh, where one of the poorest states of India, but where more than 1,000 primary health centers had been powered up with distributed solar. And when we did the evaluation of whether there's, uh, how that changes the energy uh, or electricity supply in the primary health center, and then also how it impacts the uh, health outcomes. Pregnant women choosing to have a delivery there rather than at home, uh, vaccination improvements, etc. But I just, uh, in the, uh, I know we are out of time, so I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank you, all three of you, for your candor, um, for the, the, uh, the honesty with which you've expressed the trade-offs that we are dealing with. Um, I can assure you at CEW we are not, uh, we're nothing but analysts. Um, sometimes we um, look at what, what the tree hugging might result in and sometimes we look at what the non-tree hugging might result in, but it's our analysis that gives us the ability to uh, offer the right answers. So I'm going to thank you very much.